is um, a, a session that I've sort of um, put together trying to address the, the sort of brief in terms of trying to um, bring some lessons for engineers of whatever sort of flavor they are if they like if you like so you know it's not just about civil and structural engineering even though that's a lot of what i'm going to talk about because that's why I, I am um but I'm, I'm sure there's lots of things that people can take away from this session that uh you know even if they if, if the different types of engineers if you like so you know mechanical um electrical um, whatever um and um, it, it's a sort of, it brings together, I don't know, just over 30 years of sort of my experience from um, when I was a student and then when I went into industry for about 20 years and then more latterly um, as an educator um, at the University of Sheffield in the UK. And um, as, as the title suggests, uh, engineering is very definitely not just about the technical side, the analysis and design, even though that's that's very important, but there's a lot more, a lot more to it and uh, as, as the sort of title of this session uh, suggests in terms of being an entrepreneur. So um, just to give you a very brief overview of um, the, well, myself really in terms of what I've done and, and where I've been working and the sort of things I've been doing. Um, so I started off, um, graduated from University of Leeds 88. Um, I then went to work for a, a medium sized uh, consultancy for just over 20 years more or less. I did have a couple of years somewhere else just to uh, see if the grass was any greener and Guess what it wasn't so i went back um and it was a really interesting company that i worked for I did some lots of, sort of design led projects which we'll see a few of later um i didn't sort of rush to get chartered i became chartered seven years after i um graduated because it did take a little bit of time out of, of, out of industry um, and then a couple of years ago i became a fellow of the institution of structural engineers so when i teach um four days a week at the university of sheffield i've been doing that since 2011 um, teaching on the sort of structural design modules, multi-story building design for the second and third years. And I also run our integrated design project. And there's the link uh, if you want to find out a little bit more about that. Um, but we will, we'll of cover that in the, in the session anyway. Um, at about the same time as I started at the University of Sheffield, I also um, started my own practice, John Carr Structural Design, just as a, a sole trader, as a one-man band, and that is still uh, very much alive. Uh, but about three years ago, I also teamed up with um, some architects uh, and formed a another structural design practice in Sheffield called Jam Structural Design. Um, and the reason for Jam is because it was myself and a guy called Matt, so John and Matt. Uh, but we thought it sounded quite good. So. Um, I also do quite a bit of work with the Institution of Structural Engineers, um, particularly at the sort of the, the regional group level in Yorkshire. So I'm currently the treasurer. I've also been the, the chair a few years ago. And at HQ, uh, for the uh, I also sit on the education committee. I've uh, been doing that for a few years now. Um, and if anybody wants to connect with me, uh, there is my LinkedIn uh, uh, whatever uh, connection. Just uh, please come and say hello. Okay, so um, just going back to um, early inspirations and what I call the, the Lego years, if you like. Um, these are some of the things that I, I think inspired me to become um, an engineer. Um, it was a bit of a close call at one point. I did think about going into um, accountancy, uh, but I'm pretty glad that I didn't. Might have been a bit richer, but I'm sure I wouldn't have found it half as rewarding as I found in engineering. So these are some of the toys that I sort of grew up with. Um, I don't know whether consciously my parents were trying to sort of get me into engineering, but they sort of tended to buy me sort of presents like this when I was younger, so stickle bricks, um, which apparently you can still get. Um, great fun with those and um, structure straws so pretty much anything you can build um, a little bit of Meccano although it probably wasn't my favorite my sort of main um, toy if you like when I was younger and for quite quite a long time afterwards um, was the wonderful uh, Lego I think I was also influenced to some extent about where I grew up and um, I lived um, fairly close to the city of Liverpool in the northwest uh, of England um, and I was just, I was actually just across the water um, in the peninsula called, called the Wirral Peninsula, um, which is just north of the city of Chester. So two very, very um, interesting and diverse sort of places in terms of the architecture and the built environment, but very sort of inspirational. And I would often sort of get the train to, to one or other of these cities at the weekend and just sort of walk around, um, you know, with friends and a bit of shopping and, and what have you, but uh, just looking at the buildings as well. and. That, I think that uh, 
even though I probably didn't realise at the time, it gave me quite a bit of inspiration. And then in when I was about 13 or 14, um, my father got a job in um, the United States, in uh, New Jersey, which is just across the, the Hudson River from uh, New York City. Um, and that was, as you can probably imagine, as a 13 to 14 year old, that was a pretty jaw dropping experience. And uh, just the buildings that you, you know, you see there um, really made quite an impression on me. And I think, um, you know, that was looking back, that was quite a big influence on, on me. Um, when I was putting this, these slides together, I, I was thinking that I, I never really sort of think of myself as an entrepreneur. Um, but with the sort of benefit to hindsight, I look back and think about some of the sort of money making schemes that I got up to when I was uh, younger. So in my sort of teens, typically. So, um, so I, like most people, I had a job, um, or most people back then had um, a job as a paper boy just to earn a few extra quid. Um, I also did a bit of carol singing. Um, not that I could sing, unfortunately, but uh, I don't know if people seem to take pity on me. Um, I also did mad things like clearing people's drives of snow in the not very uh, often, not very frequent days when we got snow uh, on the Wirral. Uh, I then had a Saturday job for quite a long time in a store called Dixon's, which uh, was a bit like sort of Curry's PC World. Um, lots of electrical goods and you could get discounts on those. So I was got quite into technology at the time. So that was good. Um, did a job as a, several jobs as a sort of behind the bar. Um, although I think I tend to sort of probably drank most of what I earned. So that didn't really work out terribly well. Uh, I also had a, a couple of jobs um, as a uh, as a waiter in a hotel in, in the summer. Um, I wasn't very successful at getting uh, summer placements in the industry. So, uh, so just to get some cash, I did things like that. So, yeah, I guess looking back, there's a bit of sort of entrepreneurial um, things going on. Um, now, I, have a, I, I looked up the definition of what an entrepreneur is and what enterprise is um, in the in my sort of big Oxford uh, dictionary. Um, and there's a classical definition about it, you know, starting a business and running a business and all that sort of stuff. Um, I, I tend to use a sort of wider definition as an entrepreneur being somebody who, who has an idea and does something about it, basically. Um, and I, hopefully that will sort of come through uh, as we as we go through this presentation. But it's about, you know, sort of having that initiative, having that resourcefulness and actually getting out there and, and doing something. Um, you know, it could be setting up a business. It could be something completely different. Um, so that's, uh, that's my, my take on what being an entrepreneur is in terms of a definition. So looking back uh, at my sort of career, um, started off, um, well, at university. So um, 1985 to 1988. Um, just bear in mind that we didn't have sort of phones, digital phones and cameras back then. So uh, there are a huge amount of photographs of me as a student, but this is one um, that I do remember quite very fondly. This is at the end of my final year when we were doing a project uh, on membrane structures. And you can see myself and a couple of, uh, couple of peers um, sort of sat, sat there in the park feeling quite happy with ourselves, having just um, erected our, um, our tent structure. Uh, that we'd sort of spent quite a long time designing and analysing and, and making. So uh, so this is the sort of culmination, really, of our last piece of work at university. So we're all pretty happy there and have vivid memories of that. I also have um, one of the other things I have vivid memories of is going to Abbasock in North Wales and doing a field trip and doing surveying of sort of little lanes and fields and all sorts of things. And it pretty much chucked it down for the whole week. We certainly didn't get the weather you sort of see on this uh, slide here. But again, it was um, it was quite formative, and um, I certainly remember that more than the sitting in lecture theatres. Um, and shortly before the end of uh, my time at Leeds, um, uh, an engineer from industry called Tony Hunt came and gave a talk to us um, for a, it was about an hour and a half, uh, but it went incredibly quickly, and I was absolutely fascinated by um, the projects that he was he was working on with his practice. And um, you may he's not around well he's around but the company isn't around anymore uh, but some of the things that they did um were um so the, the project here is waterloo uh, international terminal so this is the old eurostar terminal before it moved to st pancras um and things like the uh, the eden project so that was the sort of things that those guys were into so really really inspirational 
design led projects. Uh, and I, I, I listened to Tony and I thought, yeah, I really need to try and get a job with that, with this company. And um, thankfully I uh, managed to do that. So I went and joined them um, working down in the Cotswolds and Sirencester uh, in 1988. Um, but it was a bit quiet down in, uh, in the Cotswolds and Sirencester. So after about, um, about eight or nine months, I got a move up to the Sheffield office and they just won uh, the Don Valley Stadium, 25,000 seat athletic stadium that was constructed for the World Student Games in 1991. So we set up an office, we had about 20 people uh, just uh, at the top of Fargate for those of you who are from Sheffield. Uh, and this is uh, this is not a sketch that I did, but it's, uh, I always cite this as a really good example of effective communication and good sketching skills. This is uh, produced by, by one of my colleagues. And that is the um, sort of the main stand of the of the stadium, and another view there from from inside the stand. And this is this is the, the section that I was responsible for. So the sort of corner area, which sort of floats, so there's no sort of columns uh, as such. It actually just sort of hangs off the the uh, the stands rooms at, at either side. Um, and I spent quite a lot of time working on this. Um, it looks fairly straightforward, but it's quite a lot of complexity in there in terms of the details. Um, and that was a project I was really uh, proud of um, until they um, decided to demolish it in 2013 because unfortunately they hadn't um, maintained it and um, they decided it just wasn't uh, affordable. Um, so I, I can now join something called the McCallan Club, which is basically a club for engineers and architects whose projects are demolished within their, within their own lifetime. Um, so there you go, I can sell myself in a, in a bottle of McCallan if I want. We did some quite um, interesting sustainable designs, some very quite early um, uh, projects in terms of sustainability and things, things like uh, green roofs, um, not, you know, making the most natural light, um, which wasn't sort of being talked about in the, you know, in the way that it is nowadays. You know, 30 years ago, things moved on quite a lot, but then this is um, a project for RMC Concrete in, um, in Thorpe, uh, Thorpe Park in Surrey which was uh, very sustainable for its time. Uh, and another um, sustainable project, this is the School of Engineering and Manufacture, or SEM, at uh, Leicester de Montfort University. It uses lots of um, passive um, sort of ventilation. Um, and you can see the chimneys um, for, to draw the air uh, through the building. And this is, you know, for the early 1990s, this was very, very much a sort of head of its time, although Obviously, people like the, the Romans and the Greeks were actually doing this thing 2,000 years ago, but we sort of forgot about it all. And it's only sort of fairly recently we've started designing in a much more sort of sustainable way, I think. Um, and then um, the we had we had a recession. So one of the things about working in construction is that we do follow the sort of uh, economic cycle um, in society quite closely. So when there's a recession, we do tend to sort of feel that, and uh, people stop building things. Um, so at that point, I sort of jumped ship um, and went and got a job as a research associate at the University of Sheffield. So my, my first time, uh, first time I worked at Sheffield, so back in the um, mid '90s, more or less, and I worked. I did a, uh, an MPhil on the semi-rigid design of steel frames. So basically, looking at uh, steel co um, connections between beams and columns, um, and trying to um, determine the characteristics of those and see how they affected the design of steel frame buildings. Um, so that was that was an interesting sort of diversion. So I did that for about 15 months. Um, and then at that point, um, the, the money basically ran out for that contract. We completed that contract. So I um, jumped back uh, to industry. And I worked for a Sheffield consultant called HCD or Hadfield Courtwell Davison, did a few um, interesting little projects, quite a diverse range of things in and around Sheffield. Um, some fairly modern stuff, so um, supermarkets to um, repairing old uh, sort of uh, wharf buildings so down near the canal in Sheffield on the top right, and then a couple of other things uh, in Sheffield city centre, so um, conversions and new builds. So that was, I learned quite a lot there, um, but uh, it didn't, after a couple of years, I decided I'd probably learned um, as much as I was going to, and I got an offer to go back to Anthony Hunt Associates. Um, who would, uh, who were again do, still doing some really interesting work, although the office had shrunk quite a bit. So I, I went in there as just one of three uh, members of staff with the task of, of building the office back up to uh, to about 20, which is about the height of what we got to um, 
in about the, about the 15 year period. So just talking about some of the projects that we worked on um, uh, in that period at Anthony Hunt Associates. So probably the one that I'm, I'm most proud of is um, a stadium in Hull, uh, the KC Stadium. So it's a 25,000 seat stadium that was built for uh, the football and the rugby clubs. And it was also built for um, community use. So it's quite a, um, quite a common thing to do now, but back in the um, early 2000s, it wasn't particularly common to do. Uh, but they realized that to make this sustainable, um, they, had to, they had to use their facility, you know, seven days a week. It wasn't just a case of turning up for a match, you know, uh, on a Saturday afternoon. They needed to, to really make the assets work more effectively. Uh, it was quite an unusual design um, in many ways. It was um, three uh, single tier stands and a, a single um, two story stand or, or main stand, if you like. So the, the main stand is shown on the left hand side. Um, and then the single tiers um, are on the sort of um, in, on the right hand side, and the, and the sort of roof um, goes round between between the you know the two different or the different areas of, of stadium. Or, um, so yeah, so that was quite a challenge, sort of making that transition from a you know a single story, single tier stand to a two tier stand, um, and we ended up with this sort of asymmetric bowl uh, arrangement. And you can see there the that's the a section through the two tier stand and then a section through the single tier stands. So you can imagine it's you know there's obviously a transition there. You could obviously do a sort of big vertical step, but we tried to do something a bit more um, interesting and a bit more sort of fluid um, than that. We spent a lot of time thinking about how we're going to build this. Bear in mind it was in a it's actually a park that is listed. There's a lot of old you know, mature trees that we couldn't do anything with, um, so we have to be very careful. We need to preserve the character of, of, the, of the park, so we're very spent a lot of time thinking about how we're actually going to build it and drawing sort of models of the sections of roof um, and how we were going to lift them into place and the sort of logistics of all that process. So that was um, that was quite an interesting um, thing to do, and you can see here the shot on the left hand side with the actual sort of um, sections of roof. Um, constructed on the ground and then about to be lifted up into position over the, the two tier stand the main stand and uh, that's a that's a shot just showing that uh, construction process so it's always you know certainly any structural and civil engineers out there it's really important to think not just about what the finished design is going to look like but also how you're going to build it and how you're going to build it safely There were around the same time or, or sort of slightly earlier, actually, there was quite a few stadia that had been designed for, for use for concerts. Um, but they had some some issues when people actually came into them and started using them for concerts and dancing around, especially when you get the sort of, you know, certain types of music, sort of you get that rhythmic activity, everybody jumping up and down the stadium at the same time. And there were certain issues at the Card Cardiff Millennium Stadium and they had to put some temporary props in uh, when they got concerts. So our client was very, um, nervous about this and conscious that we, we didn't want the same problem here so we did quite a lot of um, dynamic modeling or modeling the dynamic behavior of the stadium um, and we did that um, we did that by by computer with our computer models so it was a I think we, we actually built half of half of the main stand which is where we thought it was going to be the main issues um, I think there's about 2,000 elements in this model it took us I think it was about two or three months to actually build it, it was quite a long time um, and then once we'd we'd done that and actually built the stadium, um, the client paid for um, some colleagues who um, well, happened to be from the University of Sheffield, complete coincidence. Um, they came and did some dynamic testing on the as-built structure. And as you can see from the uh, table in the bottom right hand side, that the testing in all but one case gave frequencies that were higher than the, the predicted uh, test results. Um, which is which is very unusual. It tends to be the other way around. The modelling tends to sort of be a, bit, a little bit optimistic in terms of what you can achieve in terms of um, dynamic behaviour. So the only there was only one um, instance where we got a, an actual actual frequency slightly lower than what we predicted, but uh, it, it turned out it wasn't critical. We we did some further analysis of that, and some further testing, and that was all fine. And it's been, the stadium has been sat there for now for the best part of twenty years, uh, and touch wood. Um, no dynamic issues. Um, 
and uh, th these are some shots of the, of the finished product from the from the park and you can see the all the trees uh, and then a nice uh, nighttime shot in the bottom right showing the sort of asymmetric bowl effect so shortly after that um we, we got asked to do a scheme for a new uh, stadium for liverpool um, in the park adjacent to uh, the existing anfield stadium and uh, being a liverpool supporter i was obviously incredibly excited to be uh, to be part of the team on this um, but unfortunately when the americans um bought the club out um about six months after we'd started designing it um, they pulled the plug on the stadium it was about the first thing they did um, so that was that was one of those jobs that got away that never happened uh, but such is life we then tended to we, we did um, quite a lot of projects in education there was a lot of money uh, in higher education particularly so at the time so colleges um, and particularly in the West Midlands we, we, we did a few projects down there and one of those was in um, a town called Walsall and Walsall um, has a lot of limestone mines um, located underneath it um, at quite quite a significant depth so typically about 40 meters but you can see these are a, a bunch of guys stood in the mine um, underneath the town centre and this just gives you an idea of the, this is a geological cross section and the, the sort of the grey Shaded limestone. You can see there that there are some some voids in that uh, in that strata, and we were essentially uh, building over some of those voids. So we we basically had to think very carefully about the amount of load we could put onto the ground so that we didn't overload the sort of sections of limestone that remained in between those voids. Um, and this this is a nice sort of plan image here that shows our site with the. Um, with the grey section being the void, so the white is this is the solid bit of limestone. So not a huge amount of limestone left, and um, quite, some quite significant volumes of limestone have been uh, extracted historically. So we looked at different lots of different solutions because basically the building that we wanted to put on was too heavy, um, and just to make things worse, we also wanted to increase the ground levels because we've got a sloping site and we wanted to level the site up. So we got about double the load that we actually wanted uh, on the site, or onto the, on the foundation level, if you like. So we we tested a number of things. So we tested that the strength of the limestone to see if we could actually get any more out of it. And this is what this this 2D sort of F finite element analysis model is doing here. Uh, but we couldn't get that to work. We um, looked at um, this is a solution where you basically sort of drill down and you put a big sock in the ground and fill it with grout um, to create a bit like a pier i suppose um, a pile foundation so that was another option that's done in, in an example in switzerland so this is how to do it so we commissioned uh, some tests of that uh, method using a big uh, sort of steel uh, cylinder the green thing you can see on in the middle photograph um, and this is the first um, attempt and it came out very nice and, and vertical and plump so we were thinking, well, that's good. Let's just see if we can repeat that, that process. And that's what happened. So clearly um, that, uh, that solution was a, was a non-starter. So we had to go back to the drawing board and have another think. And we spent quite a lot of time thinking about different options and really struggling to come up with a, a viable solution until one day we were coming back from a site meeting and I think it was the architect just made a, a sort of throwaway comment. Wouldn't it be great if we had a material, a fill material, to build up the levels that didn't weigh anything and this was the eureka moment for us and we realized that actually there was such a material even though it's not generally used in structural engineering projects it's used quite extensively in civil engineering projects and that material is polystyrene so we basically built up um, up to two meters in level uh, on the site to um, where, where where it was the sort of low level of, um, now, the, just, just to say that it's only the actual ground floor slab that is sat on this, but not sitting the actual building on it. Um, so the columns, so you can see a column in the, in the background there, that actually goes down below and through the, uh, the polystyrene onto the, the natural ground below it. Um, but we basically managed to um, build up the site levels without any additional weight on the ground. So the only thing we had to worry about was the weight of the building, which, which we could just about justify uh, over the limestone mine workings. And this is the, the finished product. So this is a 
couple of images, one external and one uh, internal. So, uh, so that was um, a really interesting uh, project. We learned a lot from that about um, evaluating different options and, um, and not giving up, basically. We needed a bit of resilience on that project. So moving, uh, moving up to, to Sheffield, um, so shortly before I started lecturing at the University of Sheffield, coincidentally, I worked on a, a new research facility, um, so the Sheffield Institution for Translational Neuroscience. Um, and they do some sort of world leading research on sort of brain uh, injuries and, and, um, and things like that. Um, and interestingly, the, the entrance canopy here, you can just about see, hopefully, the, the letter Citran. Uh, some of those letters are supporting the, the entrance canopy roof. So, um, so we're, we're fine as long as they don't change the name of this building, then we're in trouble. Um, and just some images around, around that. Uh, around that building so just to give you an idea of, of the sort of construction there it's in a sort of quite a um, built up residential area so we, we couldn't really build terribly high for, for that project we we're building into a hill as well so um, and um and yes the queen uh, came and opened that building in um, about 10 years ago so that was uh, that was all very very nice uh we also did some fun things with steel and glass so um we teamed up with a, a company that specialised in doing things like glass stairs and entrance canopies, sort of boutique hotels, that sort of thing. Um, to really think about the details on projects like this, um, they were, again, some, some really interesting stuff. Um, so that sort of brings us up to about 10 years ago. And again, um, due to another sort of swing in the global sort of financial situation, so the sort of global financial crisis of 2008, we sort of we sort of managed to get through to about the end of 2010 in our office, and then it uh, it closed. Um, so I find myself uh, looking for something else to do, and I got back in touch with uh, some colleagues that I knew from from Sheffield. And um, after a few months, I got appointed as a as a university teacher, uh, which I've been doing uh, for the last ten years. And I'm just going to let you read. I've got some quotes here that I I always show to my students just about. Um, design really I think they're, uh, they're well worth a look I'll just give you a minute to read this one so this kind of makes the point that I, I started off making this that um, it's not just about sort of the analysis and design although that is, is clearly important and in fact it's this even though this is quite an old quote it very much chimes with what people are saying nowadays in terms of sustainability. Um, you know, should we actually be building a new building? Um, do we need to build at all? And if we do, can we reuse uh, the existing buildings or in existing infrastructure or whatever it may be? Um, so I think there's some really important, really important message there in terms of sustainability. So Arabs are um, one of the most well-known um, engineering consultants in the world and they were founded by uh, Ovarov and uh, again some wise words from from him here so it's not just about um, so it's, it's about looking at many solutions looking at a range of solutions some of those are good some of those are bad um, also picked up the point that it's not just about science and engineering it's about uh, it is an art very much um, and there's creativity involved and imagination uh, involved in that process. So really important things for any type of engineer to, to bear in mind there. And then this is one that I, I always find quite amusing and, and perhaps is a bit scary for people who um, aren't sort of uh, experienced at, at, at design or at least structural civil engineering design. That it, it basically makes the point that it's not an exact science uh, and I would say you know if we can be within 10% of reality uh, then we're probably doing pretty well uh, because uh, all we're doing is essentially sort of estimating um, reality uh, we're never going to get it exactly right so just a few sort of messages from from some of those quotes um, so what we are modeling Will, will rarely, if ever, be exact, and that applies to, not, I'm sure, not just to structural analysis and modelling, um, but to, to all branches of engineering. 
It's also really important to bear in mind there's very rarely one right answer, even though our education system might, um, might sort of lead us to think that, at least in the early years of, of, of engineering degrees. So yeah, so it's the usual cases that there are several appropriate or valid solutions and also some inappropriate solutions. So the trick is to, is to try and um, consider a range of different solutions to evaluate those solutions and to come up with the solution that you think is the most appropriate um, to your client for your project. So some of the things that we've developed while I've been at Sheffield. Um, so I, I was actually brought in to develop our integrated design project in, in the third year. Um, most en engineering departments have uh, integrated design projects, uh, but the, one of the unique things about this is that it lasts for the full uh, second semester. So uh, it's a it's a 60 credit uh, piece of work if you, if you go all the way through as an MN student um, on this. And uh, we try to make it as realistic as possible um, and so that you can bring, bring together all the different things that students have learned in the first two and a half years at university, but also to apply new knowledge that they, they learned themselves, because it's really important to develop um, self-guided sort of learning and research skills in students. Uh, we can never hope to, to, to um, provide all the information uh, and all the guidance that they're going to need uh, while we're uh, while they're with at university. You, you will pick up a huge amount uh, when you go into industry. So, um, so yeah, so, so this is our, our, our real site um, that we get students to basically sort of develop. Um, this is what it used to look like. So it's um, an old gas work site, a lot of industry on the site. Um, so a lot of contamination there to think about. Um, oh, and it's right next to a river, next to the River Don. This is when it flooded in 2007. So it's a, it's a site with a history. It's a site with, a, with some issues. And, you know, if, if um, engineers were doing this for real, um, it, they would find it a really challenging project. Uh, but it's a great, it's a great learning experience we've found over the last 10 years. We've got lots of real data on the site that we use and our students can interpret. Um, and unfortunately, we can't do this anymore. But um, initially, the first few years, we were able to take our students around the site uh, and point out some of the features to them and some of the sort of design uh, considerations. And at the end of that project, um, they actually built uh, some, some physical models of, of bridges and buildings and things on the site a nice way to finish uh, the, the project. I've always, always been a big believer in learning from what's around you, um, everyday objects if you like, and a few years ago we got some money to develop a, a website um, titled The Structural Design of Everyday Objects, and um, I've provided the link there, so do have a play with that uh, in your own time if you'd like to. Um, I, I find it's a, a really inspirational uh, learning tool, and it basically looks at it can be structured as apparently banal as a sort of as a road traffic sign. Um, but when you actually think about things like this, they're subject to a whole range of different loads and forces um, and sort of, you know, in terms of, sort of bending and shear and axial force and even torsion. There's a bit of everything in there. Um, so it's actually quite a complex uh, little structure. So you can learn quite a bit from things like that. Um, you know, street furniture is quite good from learning, learning uh, about uh, structural behavior. So this is a bike stand um, in York. Even even things like benches um, and seats and uh, also you know anything that you like really, it's been designed by somebody. It's it's got a structure to it. Um, so think about how it works. Think about why they've picked the materials and why is that bench stainless steel as opposed to uh, a different type of material. So yeah, learn from what's around you. We also um, developed a bridge club that ran for a few years because um, we were we were really into making some physical models. Um, this is an institution of civil engineers bridge that inspired us. Um, set up um, to, as, as sort of, you know they take that around schools and things. So we decided we get our own um, bridge. Um, so we we got some students in to help us with that and to help us uh, do the design and they produced some computer models of that and um, some, some some models that we could use to get costs and to do for some use for fabrication and. Um, after a few months of work, um, we, we um, came up with our, our finished product, and this is one of my colleagues is helping to build uh, the bridge. Uh, and I think that's his, it. Used to live in our, our diamond um, engineering building. It's now in a in a building that's off site, uh, but we just do still take it out um, for um, for outreach work and things. 
uh, and this is an example of some year 11 students who, uh, who came in uh, for some outreach work. Uh, we're also inspired by, uh, again, structures are, are around us and this particular bridge, which is the uh, Thorpe uh, Rail Bridge uh, near Edinburgh, we decided to try and recreate that as a structural model. Uh, although we didn't quite get the geometry right and our arms were pretty sore at the end of that day. So, uh, yeah, just, um, but it, it, was, it was still really good fun and a really good learning process. Um, one project that we um, we also established about the same time and got some funding for is something called the Virtual Design Consultancy because we're really uh, keen that students get, uh, get some design um, outside of the university or outside of the lecture theatre, if you like. Um, now, ideally, that will be um, going to for summer placement or a year in industry placement. But if that's not possible, we, we do offer a one or two week um, consultancy uh, for about 30 students, usually just at the end of the summer vacation, and we get them to work on sort of real project briefs. And again, that can involve building some uh, physical models, as you can see here. So that's, um, again, that's, that's something that we're uh, pretty proud of at Sheffield. Okay, um, I realise I'm um, need to speed up a little bit, so uh, I'll just go through things fairly quickly now. Uh, coming back to what I was saying before about learning from what is around us, so we can learn about good design, and here are some examples of that. Um, so I was up in Dundee recently, the B&A. This is um, you know, Commonwealth building now, the Design Museum down in London. A beautiful piece of uh, exposed concrete. You perhaps wouldn't use, do that solution now in terms of sustainability, but it's still a, a beautiful piece of structure. Um, even to things like this is an old petrol station in London that's been converted to, to a flower shop, 24 7 flower shop. But, you know, in terms of reuse of existing uh, buildings, quite a nice example. Um, and this is a, uh, a sort of food court in Sheffield um, called Commune. And it's a, an old 1960s or 1950s possibly concrete building. Could have easily been knocked down, but they've decided to, to keep it and expose the structure. And it's a really nice space to go and have a drink or something to eat in. A few years ago, I did a uh, sabbatical in Copenhagen and uh, Aalborg in Denmark, and uh, spent quite a lot of time photographing some of the sort of structures that I found uh, around there. Some really elegant structures by the waterside. This is the um, new um, uh, opera house in uh, in Copenhagen. Some very very um, slender cantilever roof on that, and even things as you know, as sort of um, like. Um, a bit of furniture so this is actually a coat stand and a hat stand in a, in a restaurant that i went to uh, in denmark uh, and i just sort of put that away in a sort of memory bank thinking yeah maybe one day i can use that as a bit of a bit of a solution for a project uh, who knows so you're always on the be on the lookout for inspiration um cape town south africa so um this is um thomas heatherwick project so thomas heatherwick is um is an, a british designer works all over the world and this is an old grain silo that's converted into a hotel uh, and an art gallery um, on the waterfront in Cape Town. So again, a very sustainable solution. Um, also in South Africa, this is a bit of a sort of surf shack. So somebody just put a container down there and a bit of a membrane roof. Um, and this is a you know a sort of a pop-up uh, type uh, surf surf shop next to the beach. Uh, and then going back um, back to Dundee, this is the um, the Tay Bridge the river, um, the River Tay in Dundee, just a, a really beautiful uh, piece of engineering, I think. So trying to think about what makes good design is, um, is quite helpful. And this is an institution of structural engineers um, quote, again, picks out a number of different things um, related to buildings and bridges, but some of them being economic, being elegant, being safe. Um, now, bear in mind, this is a few years ago, there's no mention of sustainability in there now, so I think if we, if we, we would probably want to add that in um, to those those characteristics. But yeah, think about what makes good design. You can also learn about bad design. Um, so again, going back to Copenhagen and Denmark, so this is the Little Mermaid, um, and somebody recreated that in the airport shop for a chocolate display which I don't know about anybody else, but I think that's a little bit naff, although um, it was quite nice the way they sort of made it out of pieces of timber that connect together. So even from bad design, you can learn, you can learn things. Um, this is in, uh, not Paris, but it's in Las Vegas, uh, where they've recreated lots of um, 
the European monument. So you can also see the um, Campanile um, from Florence, I think, in the background uh, with the green roof. And um, yeah, this is this doesn't really do it for me. Uh, maybe it does for you, but it's um, not my idea of good design, to be honest. Um, and the Millennium Bridge in London. So, I mean, it's a beautiful piece of engineering architecture, uh, but unfortunately they didn't get get the sort of dynamics right and it, um, they had to close after a day or two when it initially opened and spent quite a lot of money having to um, add dampers to, to stop the lateral excitation of that bridge. So, um, yeah, and we, we, again, we've learned a lot from that piece of design. It's been widely written about. So, so there you go. Um, oh, this is... Um, this is in South Africa. This is this is the sort of government sort of primary school, sort of ministry building. Um, with, yeah, I, I think it's not quite sure about the sort of windows, the triangular, circular, and square windows. It looks a little, um, whatever. Uh, doesn't doesn't really do it for me. Again, in South Africa, uh, fake timber columns. Um, why do you need to fake timber? You know, it's a beautiful material. Why not use proper timber? Um, so yeah doesn't do it for me. Um, nine, late 1960s, this is um, a really important building in terms of the development of the building regulations in the UK. There's an explosion in a block of flats in um, in London um, and it caused um, all the, the court, that corner of the building to, to come down. So I think the explosion happened on the fourth floor. The building was made out of precast concrete panels that weren't tied together. So um, basically they they, they changed the building regulations after this and said, right, you, you now need to make sure that everything's tied together so that you've got robust structure and that the any collapse that you do get isn't disproportionate to the initial cause. So uh, an example of bad design, but we've learned uh, from that. Um, earlier this summer, I went up to um, Glasgow, so where COP26 was, um, and this is a building on the waterfront by Zaha Hadid. Um, this is the Transport Museum. It's a very iconic building, um, but in terms of the amount of work that has to be done structurally to get that sort of front facade to work, um, I, there's some really, really heavy steel work in that roof. Um, and I, for me, again, it doesn't particularly work. I don't think you really sort of appreciate it on the inside. I don't think there's any great benefits in doing that. And I think it's a, just a bit of an architect's whim. Um, so, yeah. Um, We've, we've, we've talked a little bit about experimenting and prototyping when identifying options in terms of the Warsaw College project with the limestone mine workings. Um, we did quite a lot of prototyping when I was um, building this the membrane structure that I talked about earlier when I was at university. And one of the most famous buildings in the world was initially that the design was developed using uh, a series of models like this. And hopefully you're starting to get a feel for the which building it might be. Uh, it is, of course, the, the Sydney Opera House and the Arabs, the engineers, spent a long time trying to figure out how they were going to get this to work structurally. Um, and they, they looked at the sort of sphere and, and cutting sections out of the sphere um, to, as, as inspiration for their solution. And we've now got a, a world class piece of uh, engineering architecture uh, in Sydney. And the Walsall College project, so I'll not, uh, I'll not go through that again. At the same time I joined uh, the university, I um, set up my own practice um, to do some private consultancy work and I've done all sorts of bits and pieces. So this is um, somebody's basically garden room. Um, and that's, that's the structural model for it. I did some, some um, pro bono work uh, in Romania for a, for a playground for a school uh, with some of our architecture students. That was really, uh, really rewarding. Um, this is a number project. That, canopy at a, um, a listed building in, in the gardens uh, inspired by an angle poised lamp. Do quite a bit of um, domestic projects, some some quite nice new build projects. This is one called the Hen House uh, in Sheffield on a very a bit of a ravine, very steep and sloped, uh, heavily wooded site. So that was quite a challenge in terms of how we actually built that. Uh, but a very green solution is um, almost entirely made out of timber. There's a little bit of steel in there, um, but, uh, almost entirely timber. And um, so I've done quite a few houses for architects. This is another one uh, in Sheffield, in a very tight sort of uh, uh, tight site between two existing buildings. And again, another uh, another environmental environmentally friendly building, sort of passive house um, uh, standard. 
for that. Current projects, um, I'm working on this. This is actually a house, because it's called a long house. It's about 50 meters long um, on a site about an hour south of Sheffield uh, in the in the Derbyshire countryside near Carsington Reservoir. Um, very complex roof, roof geometry. Um, so we have to do some, some interesting 3D modeling and we actually did a mock-up in the fabrication shop just to prove that everything would actually fit together uh, before we took it onto, onto site. Um, so following on from that, one of the architects that I did a lot of work for, or do a lot of work for, um, Paul Tester, who also teaches um, at the School of Architecture, um, we decided to set up a company together called Jam Structural Design, which is initially just to service the project that um, Paul's architecture colleagues uh, were working on. Um, so that's been going for for almost three years now, and that's uh, that's going that's going well. Um, so working on all sorts of projects, mainly mainly domestic. So um, this is a, a one and a half million pound house that one of our clients has just purchased that we're uh, just starting to uh, sort of rip the guts out of uh, for them. Um, all sorts of yeah um, sort of dom domestic projects on some, some quite interesting sites. So Sheffield's quite hilly, so a lot of these sites are sort of built into the hill. So lots of retaining structures and things like that. So quite clever sort of uh, interventions. Um, the, the image on the bottom, that's actually a, a 1968 Swedish kit house uh, that we're trying to uh, trying to extend in a conservation area. That's an interesting little project as well. Um, a few non-domestic projects. So this is a, um, uh, a micro farm uh, for growing aquaponic plants um, in Sheffield. Um, the one on the right is a little footbridge that we're doing um, to help um, a housing development, so going over a, a, a stream, um, just something for, for the planning application. And then um, this, this is a fairly horrendous site that we're looking at near Chesterfield. Um, we put in a new sort of office facility uh, on there, but you can see some incredibly um, oily and contaminated ground there. So we, we don't just do, get to do the nice sort of sexy jobs. We, we also rub our sleeves up and do some, some pretty gritty uh, pieces of work as well. Uh, one of the services that we're offering um, for the as part of jam structural design is to do um, embodied carbon um, calculations for our clients uh, should they wish to to do that and a lot of our clients are very environmentally focused and are, are taking up uh, and paying for that service now so that's uh, that's good and we're using that of course to, to drive down the amount of carbon in our project okay uh, nearly there now um so I also talked a little bit earlier about my work with the Institutional Structural Engineers, so a few of the initiatives that we've done with them. Um, so in the Yorkshire region, we've set up something called the Engineering Practice Course. For, so it's for engineers who um, are putting together their, um, their portfolios, and there's a whole range of different criteria that you need to sort of satisfy. So around, um, it's not just sort of the technical design, but you know, management, law, health and safety, commercial awareness, those sorts of things. So we provide um, some guidance and some um, some resources on on those uh, um, attributes uh, for for graduate members who are working towards uh, chartership. Uh, we also um, made a contribution towards the ICE's um, Sheffield Civilized Place uh, map. So you can uh, if you, you you can download that from the ICE website and go and do a little walking tour of all the sort of civil civil engineering projects um, in and around Sheffield. Uh, and in fact, we've, we've recently produced one of those for Leeds as well. Uh, myself and a colleague, and well, in fact, a few colleagues from around the country in academia and industry, um, worked on this, this book on conceptual design and buildings that came out last April. Um, so myself and Richard Harper, we wrote three chapters of the book between us. Um, and that's actually the biggest selling uh, book of all time uh, for the Eistruck D. Uh, not huge numbers in the grand scheme of things, so probably about a thousand copies, but uh, and lots, but lots of downloads. And if you haven't had a chance to look at that yet, uh, then please do. And it's uh, it's available on on CIS, um, which I know certain such students Sheffield can access, and uh, from other universities as well, hopefully. So, uh, and then finally, just what I think are a few characteristics of what makes a an enterprising or a successful engineer, uh, and I'm sure the two things are very much interlinked. Um, the first one is to always seek out opportunities. And I've talked about two of the opportunities that I had in industry. Um, so when I went um, into uh, to, to do uh, some research at the University of Sheffield, so that corresponded to a, a, sort of a, a recession in the late, uh, well, the early 1990s. 
and then around 2008, 2010, again, there was the global financial crisis. Um, and that was sort of ultimately what led to me um, setting up my own business and uh, becoming a university uh, teacher. Creativity, I think all, all good engineers uh, need to be creative. And um, you can see the creative, you know, I, I think the creativity bit is, is the fun bits of doing the concept design. Um, yeah, you have to do the, the sort of detailed design as well. That's sort of part of it, but the creativity and concept stuff is, I think is, is great fun. Um, I think it's really important that we have lots of ideas, that we generate lots of ideas, because we're just coming up with the, the same solution all the time and doing what we did in the last project. So always look at you know the range of options, always be asking questions, always interrogate the brief. Uh, again, these are all characteristics, I think, of uh, successful engineers. And paying attention to detail. So the Warsaw College project we talked about, we had some exposed exposed structure, a lot of exposed structure, just to save money. So we had to spend a lot of time thinking about what all those junctions looked like. Uh, and this is uh, just just one sort of, of the details that we produced to, to show that. Um, and, and another couple of details here. So this is the sort of atrium roof, some very slender little um, pin plates connecting connecting that roof to the main building. Again, a lot of time uh, went into thinking about that detail. Um, and then I'm just going to flip through these one by one. Hopefully these sort of pretty much speak for themselves, these different characteristics um, that I think hopefully apply to me and um, hopefully they apply to you guys as well. So it's always good to work on an interesting projects. Not that all projects are interesting, but certainly find out the elements of a project that are interesting. There's always something in there that makes a project interesting, in my opinion. Um, just the top one here is just quite important. A lot of the business that I get, uh, a lot of the clients that come to me, are because we have a reputation for being helpful, proactive, and flexible. Um, perhaps a little bit more than some of our competitors. Um, and that, uh, that was really, I think, has brought us a lot of business. Um, really good to work with lots of different people and ideally people that you like and um, life's too short to work with people that you don't like I think um, and again learn learn from those people and one thing I very consciously wanted to do was always to um, continue doing engineering as opposed to just being a manager and if somebody comes to me with a problem um, I what I like to think is how are we going to get something to work how is this going to work as opposed to there are lots of reasons why it won't work, which is often thing to engineers. So yeah, we talked about looking at options and always be prepared to defend your, your proposals. And uh, certainly civil and structural engineering is quite a small industry, certainly in around Sheffield. So uh, yeah, it's always a good idea to try not to burn your bridges if you can. And sometimes you get projects that, for various reasons, it's just not happening. The client just ignores your advice. Um, sometimes you have to be prepared to walk away from a project. It's, uh, don't like to do it, but sometimes it's, uh, it's necessary. And of course, we've not talked about technical knowledge and technical skills. That's kind of taken as red. So these are the sort of, I guess, the, the extra overs that make the difference. And finally, just a few, law, a few of my laws of engineering. And okay, 